Hey everyone, the name is Chris Barucci. Welcome to Common Time 24. It's been a long time since I've done one of these Q&As, so um, it's long due. Let's get into it. If you want to get any additional infos uh, like timestamps, gear links, etc., or also my uh, my merchandise, this is a brand new gear corner uh, hoodies and t-shirts just dropped. So uh, make sure to check that out, and of course subscribe to the channel if you like what I'm doing here. Let's get into the first comment, which is from Kilo. Cool video as usual, dude. Thanks, man. Um, here's a question for your next Q&A maybe. Do you do all the maintenance by yourself on your guitars, even fret leveling? and refretting, or even with your knowledge, do you have a trusted luthier who does these jobs? Um, a bit of both, actually. I do most of the stuff myself because uh, I really, really like doing all that. And uh, that's exactly the reason why I decided to learn as much as I can over the last couple of years. Um, so um, working as a, a guitar tech at Toman, you, you, know, you learn a lot and uh, I had, the best possible luthier is um, watching over my shoulder and, and showing me all the tricks and all the tips and whatever. So um, I'm, I really, really enjoy doing that. So uh, for that reason, I do most of the stuff myself. Like if it's refretting, absolutely yes. Uh, fret leveling, obviously as well. If it's um, f fixing the electronics or swapping parts or uh, taking care of anything else, uh, like you know, uh, finishing and all that. So yeah, I, I do that myself. The only thing that I do not do myself is uh, where I need tools that I don't have. I don't have a, a proper workshop at home, so um, I cannot do certain things. And uh, I just, I have a couple of people who I can uh, really trust and uh, I will call or ask in person, however it works out. Um, for example, maybe you remember my pink bass, uh, the, uh, the Squire bass I um, refinished and you know, upgrade and everything. Um, that needed a new routing for the bridge pickup because the original routing was like a Squire measurement and um, a Fender sized uh, jazz bass pickup would not have uh, fitted in there. And also it was on the wrong spot. So that hole needed to be filled up and rerouted on the right spot with the right measurements. And I don't have any of the uh, routing templates. I don't have a router with a, a distance ring, like something that lets you follow uh, like um, a template. So obviously that wouldn't have worked out really well without all that. So uh, I asked uh, Xaver, who's the um, the mastermind and well, Mr. Franz Bass personally, very good friend of mine and an insane um, luthier. So um, he offered me to go to his uh, workshop and he helped out with all of that. So um, yeah, there are things that I cannot do uh, because of not having the proper tools. There are things that I've never done, so I would not trust myself just experimenting on my guitars, doing those things, uh, which are just very few things, like actually building an instrument from scratch. Those things I've never done before, so that, that's definitely on the list. I will get into that as soon as I find time. Uh, this is from Soren Bogdan. The music you play during these two videos is very interesting. I'm not sure which videos uh, Sorin is talking about, but it's not really relevant in terms of the, the question. So let's just move on. Uh, different than you play usually. Some parts sound like a kind of prog metal. I need an advice. I'm stuck in metal playing, palm muting, heavy riffing, etc. What do you do to be able to play some classic rock or blues oriented stuff similar with music you play. I really believe that this is a relevant subject for many, many metal or heavy rock players. Because I've been there and I've struggled long enough to, you know, to have some sort of an understanding of that issue, which is that you get stuck in a certain style and if you want to do anything else, it just sounds lame or weird or just you just don't feel comfortable you don't know what to pay attention to you know because it's 
with metal, you have some things that are crucial. And then there are some things that just don't make a lot of sense because of all the gain and the kind of riffs you're playing. So uh, I do get it and it's not easy. And I, I am actually um, already thinking about a video that I could make on this subject. So let me know if, uh, if you would find that video interesting. <laughs> This next one is from Fat Boy 2. <laughs> great video as usual, Chris. Uh, it would be great if you, master reviewers, ooh, thank you, uh, would locate the pedal in the pedal board chain. Briefly, what, if any, would you replace with it? It seems that beside modulation, very little else is needed. I think this is a very good point, and it's actually something that's one of the most complicated things to do right as like a YouTube uh, you know, guitar player or reviewer or whatever, uh, because you can never know what kind of viewers you'll have. Like, there are, of course, beginners who appreciate all the infos because they just don't have the amount of experience yet to sort of know immediately where you have a pedal in your signal chain, for instance. Uh, then there are the intermediate viewers who know most of this stuff but sometimes get some nice you know little infos that they appreciate but they want less explanation and less uh, super detailed uh, you know all that um, and then of course there are people who play as long as the person who's making the video plays and they just mainly don't care about all the additional infos they just want to hear the pedal and maybe get like the the personal thoughts like how it felt playing it that, that couldn't be useful for someone like that who knows a lot about all the hows and whens and everything so um yeah i try to make it as as simple as possible in my videos i put all my signal chain in the description box under each and every video i spend probably way too much time on my description box info field i i am really meticulous about that and put like you know the signal chain in an order like i start with the guitar then the drive pedals then the whatever else i use modulation or delay then the amp or amps if i'm using two then the um the aux box or the cap tracks whichever i used in that video um and then from there on it just goes my signal just goes into the audio interface and in the computer so it's a i try to make it as transparent and simple to understand as possible but still i get it there are things that are super obvious for someone with you know 20 plus years of experience and is not at all obvious for those who barely just started you know trying out pedals and understanding the pedal order and all those things so if you if you want to know more about how i did it what i did just ask me in the comments i will uh, unless i just oversee that comment which sometimes possibly happens but most of the cases, I will come back to you. The comment sections under my videos are one of the best places on the internet, honestly. It's uh, full with really cool people, people with experience who are happy to, to help you out if you have a question like this. Uh, and of course, other people who would maybe have just another kind of input that could help you. And of course, I'm also checking those comments. This next question came up a lot lately. I don't, I don't know why all of a sudden, but... I've got this question on Instagram multiple times. Uh, I got this on YouTube uh, from Laszlo Solnoki. Um, see you, Lati. <laughs> Sounds like a Hungarian name, so, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's about my pick. Like, what do I do with my pick when I'm finger picking? So, hey, 
where did you hide your plectrum while doing finger picking during the intro track? Um, he's talking about the intro playing this uh, Adele cover I did uh, at the beginning of my PJD Carry Apprentice, the, the green guitar with the one bridge P90. So what do I do with the pick? It's not that crazy. It's just uh, me holding the pick like everyone else. And then whenever I want to finger pick, I slide it with my thumb uh, behind my ring finger. So uh, I just slide it up down here and sort of clamp it in. Like it gets stuck between the first section of my ring finger and the side of my palm, really. So uh, I have the pick here and this way I can actually use all my fingers, even my ring finger. And when, whenever I need it, I just slide it to the front with my thumb and I have it right there. So it's, it's really a thumb kind of trick. <laughs> Talking of Instagram, uh, this came on Instagram and it's a, a, a message request. In case you want to write me like a, a private message on Instagram, I don't see it. It's uh, it, it gets added in a message request box, which is not where your personal or private messages are. And I don't see it. It's, it's a mess in there. I would maybe sometimes check in there and like I see two months old questions and it's like I feel so bad about it but I cannot possibly check all these social media platforms for all kinds of hidden places where someone requested something and I try to be really consistent in terms of uh, comment sections on YouTube so if you have a question please stick to the comment sections and um, if it's a sort of a personal request you can still make it less personal if you don't want to share too much info on a public you know, uh, surface like a, a YouTube comment section. So this one came, as told, quite a while ago uh, from Elias Wispar. Hey Chris, my dad is a huge fan of you. That's humbling and makes me wonder... <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> but that's really cool. Um, there's a huge fan of you and wanted to ask what bridge pickup you have in your strat. It's a Telecaster, same with Duncan Antiquity. Well, you just answered it, exactly. Um, but is it on Anico 2 or Anico 5? Much love from Germany. Here is the guitar we're talking about. Um, this pickup is a Tele pickup. Um, I made a video on this guitar where I talk about all the details and all the specs and everything. And uh, this is a flat uh, pole piece version, which is the 50 style. Um, antiquity tally pickup and this is their Alnico 2 magnet model um, apparently they have an Alnico 5 I didn't even realize that they have like a 60s style uh, tally set where the two middle pull pieces are raised a little to follow the the radius of the fretboard uh, this is the flat top version uh, which is the 50s one and it's an Alnico 2 and I love that because of all that mid-range and they don't want this to be too sparkly, uh, which would be more of a, a 60s style Tele and Strat tone. I wanted this to give me all the mid-range that a Tele pickup can give you, because because uh, that's what I prefer in the bridge position. It's just, if I play blues rock or rock or whatever else, um, mid-range is, is all I want and um, not too much sparkle. Savino Minerva. When going from 10s to 11, uh, gauge strings on a Strat or similar tremolo guitar, would you rather screw further the trem claw on the back or is it better adding another spring for balancing the added tension? Um, it really depends, man. Um, first of all, every guitar reacts a little different. Um, I know this is one of those subjects that's really hard to <laughs> digest, but each and every guitar reacts in a different way. But as a generic rule, I would say if you stick to the same amount of uh, springs, let's say you have 
three springs in your guitar and you go from like a standard E tuning 10 gauge set to an 11 gauge and want to tune it to the same pitch like a standard E tuning, um, I would try um, screwing the, the claw and on the back. Good, that my strat is here. <laughs> I, would, I would go further in with the claw by turning these two screws because that will still maintain some um, flexibility in terms of uh, tremolo arm movement because if you add an, an additional spring uh, you will immediately stiffen uh, the, f the feel of the tremolo. Loopy Lawless, can I ask you how you record your tone on camera? I'll keep on reading the comment, but let's talk about this section first. Um, I don't record my tone on camera. I record just the video on camera and I record this, like my speech or, uh, or my guitar tones with the computer. I have an audio interface connected to the, to the computer. That's where all the audio signal goes in and gets recorded. And uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because if I record audio, I will most probably have to do something to it to make it sound as realistic to this, the experience I have in the room as possible. So you will probably need some low cut or you will maybe need some compression for the speech mic or whatever it is. You will want to do some minor tweaks to that audio to make it sound the same way as your experience was in the room, which is my ultimate goal with all my videos. And then when I'm done with the audio and I'm happy, I just make a, a mix down and that will be synchronized with the video file in a video editing software. Uh, which is something you will probably have to use anyhow, because whatever you record, there's going to be some messy parts or boring parts or just nonsense that you want to cut out. So you will need some sort of a video editor anyhow. And for that reason, why not just doing it this way, which is, which allows you to have the most amount of um, possibilities in terms of fine tuning and editing and everything. I am trying doing some videos, but the sound is not this great. Uh, my idea was to play into my interface with amp and IRs and then go from the headphones out in the microphone input of the camera. Uh, do you use IRs or how do you get this sound in your videos? In theory, that could work, but believe me, that's a lot of trouble for something that will not help you at all. Going out from your audio interface with the headphones out into the camera's microphone in, that's not going to work because of the, um, the impedance differences and, and gain differences. Headphones out is already amplified. A microphone in uh, will have just a way too hot preamp for that input. So uh, you'll need weird cables and you'll probably still have some synchronizing issues in the camera because the audio just travel through a lot of stuff and um, analog digital digital analog addi converters until it arrives in the camera so it's not going to be in sync with your hand movement uh, it's too much trouble you will not save yourself any, any time with this you, that's just going to be way too complicated and probably will not work the way you want it and here's one about Guitar pedals, because we love pedals, right? I do. Simon Kermandy, which sounds very much Hungarian. Simon Kermandy. Hello, Simon. You know, I'm starting to really wonder why we got into using effects pedals on our guitars in the first place. Was it to obsess about the supposed sonic superior superiority <laughs> of X, Y, or Z electronic component technologies and pedals, or was it to actually make music with these things? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a legit question. Um, it's probably both. Like, 
it's in a way entertainment for ourselves. At least that's how I see it for most of us who love pedals that much. Um, it's about the adventure as much as about creating music with it, which I get if someone would say like, that's just stupid and uh, I don't want to be a part of that weirdness. I, I totally understand it, uh, but it's just, it's just how it is. For most of us who play an instrument for, you know, 10 plus or 20 plus years, every little piece of motivation, whatever it is, is just worth gold. Because if you stick to the exact same rig, let's say one guitar and one amp, and that's it, um, for so long, you can get bored, like really bored of that sound, even though it's awesome. Like on a theoretical level, you would say like, that is a fantastic sound. I'm so proud to be able to sound like that. Still, it's just getting more and more boring to listen to yourself while you play sounding like that. So every little tweak, you know, just a different amp or a different pedal or something that makes things it just interesting and less predictable for yourself while you're playing is so cool and actually helps many of us to stay interested in this whole thing. And I'm definitely one of those people. Like if I only get to play the same thing forever, I don't know if I want to pick up the guitar that often. I want excitement. I want to I want to hear something that's kind of new and I can experiment with and um, does things that I, I wasn't expecting it to do and, and get really excited about it. And that triggers me to play in a different way or, or write different licks. Um, that's, that's all what this is about. And there's one more comment, uh, Simon or Shimon uh, wrote under the same video, which was by the way, my DIY clan video where I was talking about like SMD, parts or uh, pedals and hand wired or hand soldered pedals and all those things like being nerdy and snobby about parts in a pedal all that kind of subject uh, and he wrote and before people start pointing out that smds are more reliable than conventional components i've owned electric devices that were built using uh, conventional components and devices that were built using smds the devices using smds failed within about a month of me buying them, whereas the devices built using conventional components still kept working. Go figure. Um, yeah, that's always the, the subject about um, producing amps and pedals, like everything that's electronic um, and is a part of the guitar signal chain. If you think about the, the, the methods, the one that includes more human uh, work it has to be the one that will include more failure or a bigger percentage of human failure, which is something that happens way more often than a robotic arm that's been programmed to do the exact same thing a million times a day, because that's just going to do exactly the same thing. So in terms of like the theory behind these, the SMD technology has to be more reliable, like just you know, that's, that's the theory. But since most of those companies, not all, but most of those companies who will use SMD technology also wants to cut their production costs to be able to offer you affordable pedals, they will, of course, not be able to produce the same quality. Like they will use maybe SMD components that are not as stable or high quality as those parts that um, a person who would hand solder the, 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 the same kind of product would choose. So it's not about the technology that most probably, this is just theory, but this is how it makes sense to me. It's not the SMD technology that makes um, an SMD pedal fail after some time, if it happens. It's most probably just one of the components that are just lower quality because they want to keep the production costs lower as told. Um, the problem with SMD devices is that you cannot really fix it because whatever is on there, that will stay on there. You cannot just 
hand desolder it and just put another part on it. It's it's just not something anyone would do for you. Like if you go to a repair shop, they will just laugh at you if you come with an SMD uh, device. They will just say like, no, um, nah. you can swap the whole circuit board if there is like a replacement part or that's it. You just uh, goodbye, get another one. Uh, if you get something that's hand soldered, you can easily desolder components and replace them. All right, thanks so much for watching this. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, let me know if you have anything else you want to add to whatever I said, or of course, if you have any questions, any statements, anything you want to share, make sure to hit thumbs up if you enjoyed this one. And uh, I'll be back. See you in the new video. Bye-bye.